Welcome to those of you watching on YouTube. This is Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. If you want to hear this entire episode with intros, outros, and music, please go to Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, etc. Please welcome to the show again, Leah Callahan. Hello. Um, thanks for having me today. I'm a little, I would say I'm a little more nervous than I was last time because your show is getting very famous and you're getting a lot of big acts and I'm like, oh. <laughs> you're the famous one on this podcast um, right now. Leah infamous. <laughs> <I'm> famous. <laughs> uh, so how have you been? Really good. Um, again, just really thrilled to be on your show. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I am knee deep in just trying to promote this record uh, which I got in my hot little hands a couple weeks ago. And like the key time to promote is really in the months leading up to the release, as opposed to after the release, because everybody says it's old at that point. So as you can imagine, I'm just really very busy and trying to be as innovative as possible on how I get this music out there. It's a really good record. Uh, before we talk about Curious Taurus, uh, which is your fifth solo record, and I think, and fourth since 2021. That's pretty incredible yes. right there. Uh, and of course, you appear on several other records before that with Betwixt, Turkish Delight. I even have a Turkish Delight cassette here for prop. Nice. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the Glass Set It's a pretty impressive uh, catalog. Um, your your lyrics are, are awesome. Uh, do you remember when you first started writing lyrics? Were you really young? I mean, were they poems when they started? Is that how you started? Yeah, no, I always was writing lyrics for songs. So it's embarrassing because I actually have a cassette from when I was in high school, which was, if it ever appears, it will be very embarrassing. And I wrote like punk songs, just sang them with no music. And they had, you know, probably very like naive political lyrics. <laughs> But, you know, I've always kind of written lyrics. And of course, I'd had my breaks where I'd quit music very dramatically for a few years here and there. So, yeah, I've always just kind of written lyrics. How young, how young were music. you? when? How young? Sorry, how young were you when you started no, writing? Uh, probably 15, give or take. But I mean, you know, it's not like I went and wrote 15, you know, for a strong 10 years. I definitely quit music when I was around that age, too, and then started up again when I was in my early 20s with Turkish Delight, so. Yeah, I remember you talking about that one of the other times that you were on the show. So you were specifically writing songs in your head. They weren't poems, right? Yeah, no, I never wow. really did much for poetry. I mean, I tried a little bit of uh, maybe, I tried writing a play, I think at one point, <laughs> maybe a little poetry. I was always interested in the arts, but theater, um, like right before Turkish Delight, I kind of did some experimental theater thing ideas, but yeah, it was always, the lyrics are always uh, part and parcel with music. Were there other songwriters at that time when you were young that you were paying attention to that influenced you and made you want to write songs? Yeah, sure. I mean, when I was very young, it was definitely post-punk, um, you know, women songwriters. Now I'm completely inarticulate, but if I had to <laughs> think about it, um, I would say Susie and the Banshees, the Raincoats, um, the Slits, you know, it was very like kind of ang Susie wasn't as angry, but most would be very angry. I liked hardcore punk, but I was always kind of drawn to any female fronted sort of punk band. So I liked Hole back in the day. I mean, I, I love that kind of uh, angry Sonic Youth, uh, which was more experimental than angry, but it was still very dark. This yeah. band, the Pain Teens, I was really into them a lot. So yeah, that kind of, that was really what influenced me early on, I would say, with lyrics. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you've had songwriting partners over the years, uh, but I, but I'm thinking you were strictly the lyricist, or did you ever write any of the music, or did you just bring the melodies? Yeah, no, <clears throat> excuse me. I was usually the lyricist. Um, it you know, it came fairly easily to me and it was what I really focused on because I don't write an instrument. I don't play an instrument, so. Which is but hard to believe, by the way, because you're so in tune to what's going on. Well, I can't thank believe you. That you I mean, I play. did play piano when I was like three, age three to about eight or nine and then started singing lessons uh, about eight, nine years old till about 15. 
But um, I remember in Turkish Chalet, because we were experimental, we would often, someone, I would pick up the drums, you know, and play drums. Um, and I think one or two of my bands, I tried to play bass. You know, and I think we all tried in the early 90s to just, you know, kind of DIY, like I would pick up a guitar. I had a an all women band for like a day. <laughs> and, you know, we had like three singers basically, but yeah, I mean, primarily it's, I've been always the lyricist and on occasion, someone else in the band would sing or write lyrics, but it just was what I did. I know that it, betwixt um, you guys shared the songwriting credits four ways. Um, I believe that's what it's like too. Yeah. Tur always. Turkish Delight also? Oh, yeah, definitely. Of course. Yeah. Any band I've been in, we always shared the songwriting credit four ways, 100%. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, even if the guitarist was bringing in all of the songs, because all of us had so much uh, participation in the co-songwriting and also just the work <laughs> that we all did. We all worked so hard. So it was always four, four ways if it was a four-piece band. What was the process? I'm going to have to ask you about Betwixt since Turkish Delight, yeah. as you said, was more experimental. Betwixt yeah. had, you know, were more like the songs were more like, I don't want to say traditional, but at that time, I guess you could say they were more traditional. Uh, what was your process? Did you just, did you, did they start writing music and ask you to write the lyrics or did you come in with lyrics and say, can we write something around these lyrics? It was definitely a mix. Um, primarily, we'd be in the in the practice space and jamming, and sometimes uh, Gordon, the cello player, would come in with a couple riffs. Um, sometimes Tom would come in with some guitar ideas. Very rarely, I would come in with a melody on its own. Um, in that same with Turkish Delight, um, I would come in just with this melody. Um, but yeah, I would e I would usually write lyrics on the spot. I was very, I'm always very much inspired by the other musicians. Um, you know, so typically, <clears throat> typically I would write along as we were performing, as we were playing. Um, sometimes I would come in with ideas, but it was usually writing right in the studio, uh, right in the practice space. I don't know. Uh, what the history was with the guys uh, from Turkish Delight, but I know Tom from Betwixt was in other bands before uh, yes. Betwixt started. So I imagine he probably had a lot of say with the songwriting as well in terms of what he brought in, or was he just passive in that way? No, I mean, he was, I mean, if all of us were just not kind of vibing off something, he would, he'd be fine with it, but we usually always would, I think we were always, like we realized there was so much sacrifice in being a musician, it's unpaid labor and among other things. And so we would always try really hard to um, try to write something to go along with the part. Um, even if immediately we were like, oh, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. We would, you know, always try to write things to go along with another part. And I don't think he was a several, you know, several years older than Gordon. He was a few years older than myself and the drummer. Um, we had a couple different drummers, but, and yes, he'd been in several bands, whereas I'd only been in one, um, but I don't, he never really asserted kind of a firm hand. This is the direction we're going in. Um, he's certainly an assertive person with a lot of ideas. And I think we were excited by that because yeah, he just came in with a lot of ideas. He did the bulk of the work of the band, for example, booking and, promotion so yeah he did a great deal um but yeah he never really kind of uh strong armed us into going into any direction he was pretty psyched that he's he's always been very into experimental music and he loved Turkish Delight uh, I think a lot of his colleagues and friends were like okay that band's all over the place they're weird and that's what he liked about Turkish Delight so he was always really excited um when we brought in something <laughs> So. The press loved Turkish Delight. I mean, you guys really hit us. I think New York, you guys were real popular in New York, weren't you? We were popular in a lot of different pockets of the United States. And I like to joke that the pockets were popular and we didn't actually tour to. <laughs> college know, radio? Tour. College, college Definitely. radio? Definitely. Yeah. Oh, it was all about the college radio. Yeah. I mean, there was really no other way we could find an audience. Um, but yeah, we did really well, especially in Atlanta, Georgia, of all things. Wow. I remember we were rock stars when we went to Atlanta. Wow. And that was actually one city that actually... When you book a tour, you know, you, you're kind of, 
uh, you get what you take, you take what you get. So sometimes you'll go to a city and you didn't even really get airplay there, but you play anyway and no one shows up. But Atlanta was the city where we both got the airplay and we had, we sold pretty much sold out a club. <laughs> so really, were you surprised yeah. when you got there or was it sold out beforehand? It was, wow. No, it was really a divey. It was called Dotties. It was great. Um, I heard, I remember were, that place. We Dottie's. kind of felt like rock stars and celebrities um, to a point where when we showed up at the radio station, Chibo Mato was there and Sean Lennon, and they were talking to us like we kind of belong there. <laughs> and I remember not really dolling up for the, um, the radio show. I kind of had my hair pulled back, no makeup. I didn't have my cool outfit, of course, that I wore later that evening. And I was like, maybe I should have dressed up more like a rock star because, you know, we were being treated, you know, like in that way. And then getting on stage that night and just having the audience kind of blow up, like respond as if say we were in a really good Boston show. It's pretty cool. Okay. I can't let that just go along, go by <laughs> here. You met Sean Lennon at a radio station. I did. Wow. I yeah, Sean Lennon and Chibo Mato. He was performing with them at the time. He was so down to earth and so nice. And the irony is a couple of the DJs were a little snootier to me than he was. <laughs> I think it's just that people, young people can be a little funny and competitive and snotty. But he just was like, hey, what's up? And like just talking like it was totally normal. So yeah, I mean, it was fun. We met some interesting kind of underground celebrities. Was that we a college station in Atlanta? WRAS. RAS. I was going to say, yeah, that's a good Unlike station. Unfortunately, a lot of college stations have been purchased by, say, NPR. And although it's public radio now, a lot of the, they're just inaccessible to people like me if I were to send a single or a CD out now. Um, but at the time, it was a college radio station. It also was huge. It was like, I don't know how many watts, but like a WBCN back in the day. It, I mean, it was a far reaching, huge college radio station. So being that was incredible to to both um, be played there and be in their top whatever 10 or top 20 and also touring there was very cool. Yeah. You know, I worked when I worked for labels, uh, college radio had such a bigger impact back then. And RAS was a great station. They were the best station in Atlanta, definitely. And then you had Athens near there. I don't know if you went to Athens, but that was a great we market did. too. We didn't get yeah. a show in Athens, but we got to experience it. And I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, so really good, down there. Yeah. good college town, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, you know, you, you began working with, I know I just spent a lot of, little time with Turkish Delight and Betwix, so I'm going to jump ahead here. You began working with uh, Richard Marr early on. I think the glass set was the first time that you started working with him. Yes, I I think I told that story, how I walked by the greenhouse in <laughs> Austin. You did. Like it's Richard Marr from my past. And he, I don't even know. I was like, I have this idea for a rock opera. I was like really frustrated with doing the solo thing for a lot of different reasons. I had this rock opera in my head and he's like, I'll get, I'll get you a band. And I was like, okay. So he got, um, that was where he got Andy and Eric, who at the time were in Codetta to do that for, you know, that album for me. And that morphed into a band. So yeah, that was my first project with Richard. Was the okay, so those guys, it was who from Codata? Sorry, it was Andy and Eric. So the guitar player and, and the bass player from the okay. band. Okay, not the guys that you work with now, because didn't a couple, no. of, one of those, they had nothing to do with Codata? I don't know why I thought they did. Alex? No, 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 not at all. Um, I mean, I'm still, I still talk to Andy a lot. And we, we actually... He would be definitely on my list if I were to try to do a solo album and I didn't have a collaborator. I mean, the fact that he has, you know, he has a kid and a full time job and is a musician, you know, it'd be very difficult to get the time for him to do it. But he would definitely be on my list of people to call. Uh, it's been a winning <laughs> ticket with you and Richard because you've done so much together. Um, can you tell us how you've been able to so perfectly incorporate the Stearns and Alex Brander into the mix. I know you talked about this a little bit, but they're like your band, you know? Now, now I don't want to confuse things here, but you worked with both Alex and Chris Stern, yes. right? But yes. not together separately? No, it's just this really interesting story. Um, so during the glass set, Chris was a fan 
So, you know, those guys are 13 years younger than me. So here I am kind of at the tail end of what I thought was going to be my music career. <laughs> and they're at the very beginning. There's these bright eyed little 20 year old guys, you know, coming into playing at the Great Scott. And <clears throat> they actually covered a glass set cover. I was so I was just so blown away. They covered a glass set song. I guess I learned through Richard because Chris, uh, Chris Stern, that's a stage name. Um, the singer for the Stearns was probably too shy to come to me, but he said to Richard that he was a fan of the glass set. So I, you know, I knew he was a singer. I knew he was a performer. Um, I guess I knew he was a songwriter, obviously, because he co-writes with Alex in the Stearns. So when Alex just totally came out of nowhere, when Richard Oh, originally I'd wanted to do back in 2020. So when Turkish Delight reformed uh, just to do a final show, it inspired me, I guess, to do music again because we were getting so much great uh, publicity and from some reissues. Um, it kind of gave me uh, the strength and the, the you know, I wasn't as uh, feeling down about music. So Richard, again, very similar to the glass set where Eric and Andy were like my instant band. Alex and Alex from the Stern, from they're actually in Big D and the kids table and Alex yeah. was also in the Stearns. They became my instant band um, and I started working with them. It was a bit of a different experience than with the Codetta guys because they were in person. So that's more traditional. You know, you hum a few bars, guitar player plays a few bars, you go back and forth. Well, I don't know. So that was really Alex just listening to everything by ear and sending me these phenomenal results. Um, and I'd say both he and Chris are like Prince because they all play, they play multiple instruments. They also now, sing and songwrite. Yeah, so, Alex and Chris Stern are not, Chris is not real, they're not brothers, right? They're, they're not related at all, yeah, no. The Chris, yeah, I they, said to Chris, you want to use that as your stage name, right? Yes. That's his. <laughs> so I don't, sorry, I've totally forgotten the question, but as far as how did I meet Alex and Alex? Oh, how yeah. You, how you got them into the mix? Because you've got a long standing thing going on with these guys now, you know? Yeah. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, you're doing a lot for, you know, you, you might not know it. And I was talking to Richard on the phone the other night, but you're doing a lot for him. You're promoting his studio without even knowing it. Because well, I, he's, I hope so. He's been, he's been pigeonholed by a lot of people as a punk rock producer, you know, you're not punk rock and you're, you're oh. like, you've got these beautiful songs and these arrangements and it's a whole new ball game. So I think you, and he agreed with this when I said, She's really promoting you, your your studio because the sound is so great. I'm sure you're aware of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he is so he is such a ridiculously good deal financially um, that I am more than happy to bend over backwards to do anything. I would sing a Richard Marr jingle, you know, to <laughs> promote his Galaxy Park because he is just a phenomenal person. And I think I've mentioned this before, not only, you know, does he give a fabulous deal and really great to work with, he's been like my cheerleader. He's always been pushing yeah. me. If it weren't for him coming to me and saying, I have a band for you. I mean, my best friends were like, don't do music again, <laughs> you know? So everyone's saying, don't do it, don't do it. And he's saying, do it. And I'm like, you know, I went with Richard. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I just owe him everything. So, yeah. Uh, let, let's talk about this new record. Um, is there anything that separates it from the last few records in your mind? Or do you feel like this is almost one long continuous project where you could actually have a box set? Yeah, um, no, it's definitely one long continuous project. I think the very first album, which I did with Sean Wardis, may not 100% fit in that. That was early, much earlier, right? Yeah, 2003, yeah. it was very cabaret, but it was also cool. I mean, I still have people come to me saying that was their favorite. Um, so interestingly, this album that's out now wasn't intended to be my solo album. I have a, a solo album that's sitting in a Google documents right now um, that Chris is working on. This was going to be a side project with myself and Chris, but Chris decided that he was going to do a little bit of a sabbatical. He took the summer off and he also bought a lot of, I think, pro tools and things that he hadn't had access to before. 
And so really did a lot of the work that Alex Stern had done, but I honestly wasn't aware that he had that ability. And again, I thought it was gonna be kind of a side project. And this other album I have that's waiting to be uh, done was kind of up in the air. I didn't know if it was gonna be, maybe I'd ask Alex to do it. Maybe I would have asked um, Andy to, to work with me. I, I knew I had an album. So the interesting thing about this album is I, had written a lot of fragments, some final songs, and I had in mind that I wanted Chris to like them because I was going to be in the side project with him, and I wanted them to be more universal. Um, I also was really not afraid to throw down pretty much anything because he could have thrown out 10 of them, which he did. 10 of them he didn't use. Two of them he, he spliced together and used as one song. So it was, it was an interesting uh, project, um, again, that I thought was going to be a, um, like kind of a band or a side project with Chris became a solo album because of all these things happening, because other folks were not available, because he, you know, suddenly decided that he was going to take a sabbatical, that he was going to invest some money in some Pro Tools, and that he was going to focus last summer on writing this album. Wow. So Alex Stern and Chris Stern, if they ever work together with you on a record? <laughs> no, I mean, if <laughs> I had the wild. budget, i uh, love to have just the more, the merrier, have more, you know, more musicians. Um, I honestly, as I mentioned, both of them are like Prince. <laughs> so I, I'm like, I mean, they all play so many instruments so great. So I'm actually not looking to add more to either. But yeah, I think, um, it's, it'd be interesting. I mean, we did that one live show. Um, I got them to perform with me for a CD release in December of last year. And just playing, literally had one rehearsal and all my friends are still talking about how incredible the guitar player was and how incredible just as, you know, a, the drummer and the bass and all of it fit together. I have one friend who said it was like being at, you know, like an arena show or being at, you know, one of the larger what are they, I don't even know what they call the the Bruin Center or whatever, the whatever Boston, center. Boston they, Garden. Boston Garden. I know that I still <laughs> call it that, but it was like it being one of those shows. The sound was so professional. So yeah, well, these guys are accomplished musicians, all of them. Yeah. I mean, that incredible. Stern's record was really good that they made years ago. Yes, and, and they put another one out. Actually, it's going. It's not out yet. They're, oh I mean, wow! Chris interrupted. I think his album to work on mine for a while. So he's actually going to be. They're going to be putting out a new album. And Alex Stern has an amazing body of work. He's like you. He's got the Pomps. He's got uh, Big D. Yeah. He's got the Sterns. He's got a lot. Of, you know, these guys are accomplished musicians. Now, for yeah. people out there listening, let me try to explain it. And you collect, correct me if I'm wrong. You guys don't ever get in a studio and play together live. You do everything separately. Now, does the band just get basically arrange all the music and then you just put your vocals over it? Is that what happens? <laughs> no, I sing into, I sing. And then the arranger will put music to, against my vocal. And I wow. will actually give a time signature. I will say I want it at this time. Um, and so they will put music around it, almost like a frame around a painting. You sing a cappella? You sing the song? sing a cappella. What? Yeah. And sometimes they will use, um, you know, different things like auto-tune, but, or to try to figure out what the heck notes I'm playing, <laughs> singing. But and I've just recently purchased a very inexpensive keyboard and I've started writing sheet music, but I've heard it doesn't help. So I, <laughs> I quite don't understand, but. Yeah, no, it's it's a cappella. It's it's just um, and they're able to listen and develop things. So essentially, even though it's it's from afar, it is not dissimilar to say I were to have a guitar and go into a practice space and they were playing a guitar or they were playing a bass or piano. They're kind of jamming in a way with me. Well, I've seen bands go in and the drummer will play all the drums and then the bass player will play over that and then the guitarist and then the vocalist would come. I've never seen it the way you do it. <laughs> it's, it's different. It's very and, unique. And, you know, they'll do the arrangements and then they'll send it to me and I say, does this work? And it's usually great. Yeah, it's a really interesting process. So it's kind of a 50-50 split then with the lyrics and the music. They do all the music, you do all the lyrics. Is that how you look at it? Well, 
No, actually, they give me credit for the music because it's the melodies. It's the major song oh. melody. So it's more like a seven. I, you know, even though they're for hire, I mean, I'd like to add a zero to what I pay. They're on the, they get publishing though, right? Yeah. They do. Um, It's usually 30%, but if they like do more, so it'd be half. And then in one case with the song Curious Tourist, um, uh, Chris would get the majority because he wrote the melody and I came and wrote the lyrics. And I think because he had that melody, doesn't matter if I wrote all the lyrics, that's that's the melody is the song. And, you, you have know, an amazing situation going on, Leah Kelly. I'm very <laughs> lucky. I'm very grateful and I'm very lucky to find yeah. people. I'm really impressed by the way. You, I know we've talked about this before, but your records just, they just keep coming. There are <laughs> several, I want to talk about some of the songs on this record because I listen. I, first of all, I have to tell you, I started telling you this before we started recording. I'm, I'm the kind of person where I buy a record if there's no lyrics in it, I'm pissed off. Okay, I have to go find the lyrics. So I'm old school. I remember being a little kid and just getting the album out and listening to the music, you know, right? So I love that you sent me all the lyrics for the songs. I imagine they're probably on Bandcamp too, right? Yes, they are. Yes, so if anyone out there is listening to this interview and you want to go on Bandcamp, you can listen and read the lyrics for free, but then you have to buy them after. Uh, after April 29th. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the new record. But your yes. old records are all up yes. there. Yeah. yeah. Your Bandcamp page is jammed. I was just <laughs> there this morning. Look, I went back to some of the old songs. because I wanted to see the difference. I think I talk about that in a minute. Um, there are several songs in this record I really like. I think right now, No One Super and Doris, is that how you say that? Do you Doris. 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 The writer, yeah. Those are my favorite. Um, oh, nice. Thank you. Do these lyrics have any secret meaning to them? I mean, I guess what I'm asking here is, uh, do they come from like personal experience or they just come out? And you, you, you know, do you make yourself write or do you write out of, you know, personal experience is the question, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's all personal experience. Um, I was consciously for this album and the next album to try to do, to try to write a certain way. So I have this quote by this guy who's both a poet and also a critic. And <clears throat> he says, good poetry takes the familiar, makes it strange and makes even the mundane memorable. And so what I really wanted to do with these songs is make the mundane memorable, um, but also in some cases make it strange, but not all the songs are strange, but I do wanna tell stories, but I wanna tell them, I wanna get better. I wanna always be challenging myself as a writer. So I'm trying really hard to write music that is relatable to other people, will, will convey an emotion, but I do wanna, um, I guess, kind of elevate uh, the lyrics to, you know, again, elevate the mundane, I guess. You know, if you if you read like I read some of the lyrics before I listened to I had listened to the songs because you had sent me the record a little while ago. So I've been listening to it. But then I went and I read some of the lyrics without listening. And it's not like they're written in a way that it's a they're written like a story. And I'm like, how in the world does she make all this fit? And then you listen to it and you see, it's like, you're not one of those people that sings like, I ran home from the sun and then I had fun. You know, you don't, you're not a rhymer. You're like, you're writing a story. <laughs> yeah, you're writing like a Super and, and social climber is over the top rhyming. But yeah, <laughs> some of it is more like prose. And I consciously tried to write like prose. And so credit to, for example, Alex and and Chris, <laughs> because I wrote the most, especially with this recent one, I wrote this very odd, you know, it had no rhyme, no normal kind of verse chorus. And Chris wrote, for example, Duras. It's very, it's more like prose. The song No One, which is one of my favorites, it's very much like prose. Um, and he wrote it in this amazing song. <laughs> so did yeah, you, credit, did you credit to them. Did you like go to school for writing? I don't know. Maybe you told me this in the past. Did you take creative writing courses or something? Never. I mean... um, no, I was actually a women's studies major in college in, you know, I was an avid reader as a child. I, you know, I was going to go to grad school, but then dropped it and um, worked for many, many years. And now actually I work 
with a lot of very smart people. And I have to read things that are way more advanced than my knowledge, a lot of science, um, a lot of different things that I have to read on a daily basis. So it's actually made me a smarter person. It's funny when you hear about people in their 40s and 50s that aren't kind of writing or creative, and it, it makes sense. They have families, they have things going on. I really feel that if you were to look at some of my poetry or some of my writing now and look at some of my poetry from my early 20s, it, it's night and day because I've, I've just been reading quite a bit. Um, I think I've definitely gotten better. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think my life experiences, um, taking time off music has affected my songwriting and just my, you know, my boring day-to-day -day job has really elevated, I use that word again, but it's really elevated my songwriting, which is bizarre because you wouldn't think that things you have to do for money would make your songwriting better, but it really has. I can really appreciate this having been, been a writer my whole life. That's all I've ever done is written poems, stories, wrote for newspapers, magazines. So I can really appreciate this. I really, um, what song was I going to talk? Oh, I really like a lot of your songs, but I want the one I'm curious about when it comes to what's going on is Nowhere Girl. Um, I just, please, can you just tell, tell us what's going on here? <laughs> Definitely. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I know a lot of artists would just be really flattered to have like a movie about their life, you know, and this is the movie about my life. I don't need a movie about my life. Like I'm already getting the movie about my life. This is really um, the first two or three minutes are me telling my story. And then the last minute or two is Chris. He wrote a whole different verse for it. So it becomes like a six minute song. So he's written many of the lyrics and certainly he's written musically the chorus. So we're co-songwriters on this. He, um, you know, he just took it and ran with it. And I, I just love what he did. Uh, the viola is a strong <clears throat> presence in the song. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is the story of my life um, telling uh, about looking, and it's similar to Duras, as an older person looking back at your youth and saying, well, I wouldn't want to be that person anymore. That's not me anymore, but it's, you know, I can appreciate that person. So yeah, that's really what it's about. Yeah, you're, you're, I don't know if I've said this like four or five times already, but I love your lyrics. They're just so good. Um, do you have like expectations for this record uh, that may be different than your previous releases? Because I get the feeling that you're, to me, you're a real artist and I don't think you really give a shit whether anyone's going to really go crazy for it or if they buy it or whatever. I think you're just mm -hmm. doing it because you're an artist. Am I wrong about that? No, I mean, any artist wants their stuff to get out there. Um, and for example, a song like Nowhere Girl, I guess if I wanted to be safe, it would have been a two and a half minute song, um, but it's more than a six minute song. But no, I 100% want my stuff to get out there. I'm, I'm very I, I, interested I, I, in, 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 and my expectations, are they different? I would say I'm a different person. I'm actually strangely more optimistic than I was if you had spoken to me and you did about a year or two ago. I'm extremely optimistic right now and I don't know why. <laughs> you have a different hairstyle too, by the way. I noticed that. Um, I, maybe that came out wrong the way I asked it. Of course you want people to like your music and you want people to buy it. But I have a feeling that you're writing the stuff that you feel and not writing for someone else is what I meant to say. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, you have to, if you try to write things that you think people will like, I mean, you're going to fail. And there's a lot of people that do that. <laughs> They like force themselves. To, yeah, they force themselves to write songs in a, in a certain way. So um, the expectation factor of this record is to just build your fan base. A hundred percent. Yeah, I am definitely at this kind of you know, the songwriting is really important to me. Getting those songs out there is really important to me. And so that's the expectation just to, to get as many people as possible um, to hear this music. Um, do you like using Bandcamp as your main tool for getting your music out there? I know you're on Spotify and everywhere else, yeah. but Bandcamp pe people can go and listen to it and they can buy it. Does it work for you? Yeah, I love Bandcamp. I mean, I've had people come to me. Um, there are actually specific blogs that just, which I need to learn more about, that will look for music on Bandcamp. There are college radio DJs that look for music on Bandcamp. 
it's become a really a real go to place for people who want to discover new music. And that's key here. People who actually don't care how many followers you have, don't care, you know, they're really just looking for music. And I've, I've seen that in the past two years that Bandcamp has become a really important place for that. So it's been really key for me. It, you know, before, I don't know what I would have done um, if I was trying to do what I'm doing without Bandcamp. Yeah, and, and also I'd like to say that there are podcasters that go on uh, Bandcamp and look for new music too, basically me. I mean, whenever I hear about a band, I usually go there first I, I or YouTube, you know, Spotify and YouTube is where I usually look. Um, I'm going to change the course here for a second. You sent me a couple of your Spotify playlists which I wish everyone would do. I love that. Everything you did to get ready for this show made it so easy for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you even said that one of the playlists, the hot and cold one inspired you on this album and, the, and uh, that you have another album in your head. Now, does that count the, the album that you said you have already done? You have another one besides that? No, that's the one. Yeah, I haven't, I have kind of had a dry period. I haven't really written anything since probably May, um, but I had these two albums. So, I mean, I wrote a ton um, in the beginning of last year. Um, so yeah, no, the, the, the hot and the cold and hot playlist, a lot of music I've been listening to for like 10, 15 years, but also, I made for Chris in a way, because I'm like, I'd, I'd like some of these sounds in the next album, just wanted to send you some inspiration. Um, and the Hot and Cold playlist is really just, you know, when people ask me what influences you, it's really hard for me to say because my music taste is so all over the place. Um, I'm no I, I'm no musicologist. If you had asked me about one of the artists on that mix, I probably wouldn't know a lot, but I know what I like. And I know those are playlists that are my go-to and that's what I listen to all the time. Yeah. Listeners, it's hot and cold and cold and hot. And the, the hot and cold is the one that inspired you. And I, I like that you put Bridget Bardot on there and Dandy Warhol's uh, Jesus and Mary Chain. Uh, the one song that I listened to and I was like, wow, this totally fits with the album that you just made lady tron your yeah. style and their styles similar i really enjoyed that that you put that i was familiar with that band but they're kind of a little below the radar and then the the cold and hot playlist was funky man it was like yeah. uh very funk it was like a faraway world from your indie pop style that's why i was Definitely. surprised and it's really great to be playing with guys who are doing ska I will admit, you know, when I was in my early 20s, I not that I didn't appreciate classic ska, for example, but I was all about the angry, <laughs> loud music. And now I'm like way more about the funk, <laughs> and like, you know, dance music. And to be able to uh, utilize, for example, um, Alex Brander, who, you know, he loves like metal, but he also... Uh, studied um, the drummer you're talking about now, right? Yeah, yeah. sorry, Alex Brand is a drummer. He actually studied um, um, what, spacing on the type of drums, um, metal. What are those metal drums? I can't believe I can't think of the word. Um, I've had a million drummers on my show, but I don't know anything about their drum sets. He, he studied, no, he studied Caribbean drumming in Trinidad. Oh. Um, and so when I heard, you know, heard that, I'd heard from Richard that he'd studied in Latin America. And I was like, that is the person for me. So if you'd heard my glass set or my solo recordings, you might not think, oh, she's really into Latin music, but I really am. So that was just an amazing, it's like if I had done a Craigslist ad and said, must like post-punk and Latin <laughs> and African, you know, music. So, and then Chris, of course, he's played in a um, steel drum. That's what it's called. Steel, steel drum. drum. Okay. Chris, yeah. Chris played in a Chris Stern, who's on this album. His first band was a ska band and he played horn. Um, so, I mean, it's just phenomenal to be playing with musicians have this incredible breadth of musical interest and talent. Yeah. I think that you, you got, you and Richard have a good system going on here. It's, it's like fantastic. I, I can't believe the way you do it. So what's next for you? You mentioned you have that record that's done um are you in like a comfort zone just recording and not dealing with the whole touring and playing routine game i mean is it just or do you think about possibly taking it out there and playing more shows yeah i mean i'm very folk i'm laser focused on writing new music and getting it out there 
and I'm making up my own rules and I'm making them up as I go. Um, so I guess, you know, if it were to come up that I, I knew that it was a good business decision to say, do a show or do more shows and that that would lead to getting my music out there. As I've expressed, I've, you know, done this before and I've played shows and I know what can you get by playing out in Boston once a month and what can you get by doing a mini tour of the United States. And so I'm, you know, pretty experienced and I know what would be a good decision. Um, so really my, my primary goal is getting these songs out there and writing new songs. So I'm anything that would hinder that, especially because I do work full time, you know, I'm not 25 anymore. <laughs> so, you know, that's really my focus. Um, I'm extremely focused on that. So that would be yeah, obviously you are because you've done so much in the last few years. It's incredible how much material you've put out. Wow. Uh, thank you for coming on and talking about the new record. And I really love it. I mean, it's like you didn't call, you know, you're not just so people out there listening. Leah doesn't call me and say, please have me on your show again. I get in touch with her and I say, I want you on the show because I love your style. I love your writing. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. So I, I think you have a great formula going with, with Richard and these guys, really good players, by the way. And your songwriting is great. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> delivering thank all you. this great music to us. Thank you. And thanks for coming on the show. Very, very grateful. Thank you.